tackling tough topics to help you think reasonably about life's most important issues. This is Thinker Sensitive. Thanks, Nicholas. That's a reverend doctor to you. Uh, everybody, I'd like to just uh, uh, t- tell you a little bit about myself. I, uh, like, like Nicholas was saying, I have a passion for having conversations about the issues that matter most in people's lives. People have real questions, and I think that honest questions deserve honest answers. That's really my passion. So as a philosopher of religion, which is kind of my vocation, <laughs> I want to make sure that we're talking about things that are really uh, deep, deep questions of life that people ask uh, does God exist? Is there meaning and purpose to all of this? Uh, is there a point to human history? And what's, what's, the role, what, what's my role? And all those kinds of things. That's, that's a big goal of mine. I'd like to just say thank you to Nicholas and Pastor Chad for, for inviting me here. Uh, I, I have been watching University Assembly uh, by, via Facebook uh, for, for the last few months, uh, just watching all the cool things that are happening here. What a cool place to call home for those of you who call this place home. And, uh, and if you don't yet call it home, I would just recommend what these guys are doing here, an awesome place to, uh, to find a family. So I'll, I'll start off my, my discussion tonight uh, on did Jesus actually rise from the dead with kind of a personal story. When I was, when I was in college, I went to a, a small liberal arts college uh, that, that had religion requirements as part of, the, as part of the, the study, the course of study, but they weren't confessional in nature. Uh, they were kind of just open open courses on religion where people could ask questions about things that mattered to them, uh, where people could engage uh, other faiths and learn about things. And there was kind of an axe to grind in the university that I went to that truth claims are not necessarily uh, the domain of religion. And I think I drank a little bit of that in in college. When When we're talking about what is truth, when we're talking about what religions claim, I kind of had this this idea that religions are not really in the realm or domain of, of truth. They're more in the realm or domain of, of deep personal meaning and opinion. And so I remember even thinking when I was in college about a question like what we're talking about tonight. Uh, you know, did Jesus rise from the dead? Are truth claims historical? Do they matter? Did these things actually happen? I remember even thinking, well, the Bible is a faith document. The Quran is a faith document. The, the beliefs of the various religions, these are, these are matters of faith. They're not matters of, of public knowledge. They're really just the kinds of things that people opine about, that they have opinions about, right? Uh, and even for me, as, as somebody who had a very sincere Christian commitment, I was missing this, this sense of, did it matter that Jesus actually rose from the dead? Is the Bible something I can trust? <laughs> uh, are the historical claims that Christians make, are these... Are these really historical claims at all? Or are they really just in the realm of faith or personal opinion? So I want you to know I've kind of gone through this. I've kind of been, been, through, this, uh, been through this question myself. And yet at the end of the day, what I want to talk about is ways in which if the Bible is making historical claims, how can we engage those historical claims? Can we know uh, for, for with any kind of certainty or with any kind of confidence that what the Bible says is true. And really, so this, this question, did Jesus rise from the dead, is part of that realm of inquiry. Is this an historical claim that we can say yes or no to? So I think uh, an important kind of first question when we're talking about something like, did Jesus actually rise from the dead, is, aren't miracles impossible? And you see how, I, how, I've, how I've asked that question, as I'm kind of assuming, well, yeah, aren't they? <laughs> right? But this is, I think, a question that I think is a fair one to start off with. See, and this is where we get, it, it, we get to the importance of method right away. The importance of method right away. Whenever you're asking a question, you have a methodology for determining how to best answer that question. And method is, is vitally important when we're, answer, when we're asking any kind of question about, about, uh, about religion or about what matters most. See, in our culture, there's a bias towards philosophical naturalism. In our culture, there's a bias towards this idea that, that the, world, the, the world of angels and gods, that this is kind of a mythical world. Or if anything, it's sort of a private subjective world. The world that I live in when I'm at, at my bed at the end of the day and I'm on my knees praying, you know, uh, praying before I go to bed. But uh, apart from that little private world, 
the world of gods and interaction in the world and angels and these kinds of things, this is just kind of a mythical world. Now, this bias towards philosophical naturalism, that there are no gods, there are no souls, there are no angels or demons, there's just matter in a material universe that obeys the laws of cause and effect, this bias towards naturalism really bucks up against a very modern sensibility, which is that of openness. You live in a culture, and I do too, where we want to engage questions with a sense of openness or tentativeness or willingness to consider alternative views and opinions. But if you have a bias towards naturalism, if you rule out ahead of time that there could be a God who could intervene in the world, then you've actually closed yourself off to a very modern sensibility, which I think can be helpful in a lot of ways, of openness. Am I willing to let the best answer rule? Am I letting to let the best reasoned argument win? See, true openness means that one is willing to consider supernatural and spiritual claims to truth. That means that if there are some people who believe that Jesus actually did rise from the dead in history, then I should have some kind of openness to entertaining if that's possible. Or could that actually happen? Is there a God, and does this God intervene in the world around me? Now, here's the thing, is that once you start allowing yourself to to be that kind of open, to say, maybe I should be open to the idea that God exists, well, then you've opened the door to an incredibly productive line of inquiry. Because if God exists, then miracles might be normal. They might be actually very uh, commonplace. Now, it's beyond the scope of this lecture to talk about this, but there are actually a lot of credible arguments for God's existence. I would recommend to you, uh, William Lane Craig has written on uh, an argument called the Kalam Cosmological Argument. There's a book by Sir Martin Rees called Just Six Numbers that talks about various cosmological constants, which speak of a universe that's finely tuned for the emergence of intelligent life. Douglas Grotice, in his tome Christian Apologetics, catalogs a lot of these arguments, which can give you true and rational reasons for your faith for your belief that maybe God exists. But if God exists, then a miracle, such as somebody rising from the dead, is not only possible, it could very well be normal. Uh, If God exists, then this addresses David Hume's critique of miracles. Because if God exists, the probability of miracles increases. And if God exists, then it's not necessarily the case that those who believe in miracles are merely superstitious. Right? If God exists, then maybe it's not just a bunch of stories that your grandma tells you to get you to be good. If God exists, then maybe this stuff does actually happen. Maybe it's possible. Now, another question is, do miracles break laws of nature? That's a fair question, right? You guys, you believe that miracles, you know, these miracles happen, but really you have laws of nature, and we know that there are laws of nature, and you, so you guys are, are believing in a system that, that uh, asserts that these laws get broken from time to time. Well, you have to have an account of what a law of nature is. What is a law of nature? See, a law of nature is something that describes the relationship between two physical kinds of things, between physical objects. So when you talk about God intervening in, among two physical objects, you've already added a non-physical agent into the relationship between physical objects. And in that sense, you're not necessarily talking about a law of nature anymore, right? You're talking about an intervention of a person, a non-physical person, into, into a physical relationship. So miracles, then, don't represent breaking laws of nature, but the intervention of a supernatural person in physical relationships between objects. See, when you add that, that person into the equation, a supernatural person, then you're not talking about breaking laws anymore. You're talking about a cause that has an effect. This cause is just a non-physical cause in the case of God, right? And I think this goes back to a very important question. Is the universe an open system or a closed system? So I'm going to explain what I mean by that, an open system or a closed system. So imagine imagine a system, and we're going to just kind of visualize this. Imagine I put the system in a box here. This is the universe. Everything that happens in the universe happens in this box, Imagine it's closed. If you're a, phys- a philosophical naturalist, remember people, they don't believe God exists. There's no, uh, there's no angels or demons or spirits. Uh, it's just physical laws in the world. 
if you're a philosophical naturalist, the universe is a closed system of cause and effect. So you have cause, effect, 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 plus nothing. So that means that everything that happens in the universe is a result of biology and chemistry. The ways that physical causes relate to other physical causes, causing, you know, causing everything that you see in the world. But again, if you open up the idea that maybe God exists, then this closed system all of a sudden loses its lid, <laughs> becomes an open system. And so people who believe in a resurrection don't claim that there is no such thing as cause and effect, or they don't, they don't believe that, that laws get broken. They just believe that there's more than just physical causes and effect in, in the universe. In an open system, persons can intervene. <laughs> There could be a supernatural being from outside the universe who could enter into it and and be an agent of cause inside the universe. What I'm suggesting to you is that we'd be willing to say, well, okay, the universe could be closed, but it could be open. If the universe could be open, then the question of did Jesus rise from the dead is on the table for discussion. Does that make sense where I'm getting with that? Okay, that's a little philosophical background. (laughs) Don't miracles just break a law of nature? Well, I don't think so. So here's some questions I'm going to ask tonight. As we we engage this question uh, of did Jesus really rise from the dead, I'm going to ask these key questions. Was Jesus dead? Did he really die? If he died, was he buried? And if if he... he, uh, if he was raised from the dead, how do we know? Was the tomb empty? Did anyone see it? And isn't this all just a legend? So those are the questions I'm going to ask tonight. Anybody have a problem with that? See, they gave me the microphone, so if you have a problem with it. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> oh, gosh. You don't want to alienate the crowd right before you talk. All right, let's keep moving. <laughs> so was Jesus dead? This is a, this is a fair question. There have been people who have denied this, you know, that Jesus actually died. I think to to start answering this question, we we need to answer the question or we need to talk a little bit about the nature of the Roman crucifixion. See, the Romans... They controlled the area in which Jesus lived. We call it Judea. That's, that's what they call it. That's what we call it as good historians. We'd say this area that they controlled, Judea, uh, they, they used crucifixion as a means of political control and punishment. Now, the Romans were really good at this. <laughs> they were really skilled at this terrible way of murdering somebody or of executing somebody. By the time somebody had gotten, to, gotten up on the cross, uh, been nailed to a cross, uh, that person had typically in, uh, endured a, a strong amount of physical beating. They had significant wounds from beatings and scourging. And the kind of beatings and scourging that, that people would endure before they were put up on a, on a wooden cross would often rip the, the flesh and internal organs of their victims. So the Romans were very good at this. So even before the crucifixion, the victim was likely to have endured extreme blood loss just from you know, by virtue of having their skin torn open, but also, uh, but also um, uh, because they had this kind of blood loss, they would have kidney malfunctions. Um, they would be extremely thirsty, and their hearts would start, to, uh, would start to weaken because they were trying to pump blood throughout the whole body without enough blood to actually pump through the body. Now, this is before somebody even got on a cross, enduring this kind of blood loss. Blood loss. But once somebody was nailed to a cross, they were nailed to the cross in such a way that, that to be able to get a, a breath, to be able to get oxygen, they had to lift themselves up using the, the wounds in, in their wrists and in their feet to push themselves up to allow their chest cavity to open. See, what would happen is, is that under the weight of, of, the, of their own body on the cross, the chest cavity would collapse on itself and they wouldn't be able to get a deep breath. So to get a breath, they had to pull themselves up now, you can imagine with the amount of beating and scourging that somebody had that would lead to even kidney malfunctions, incredible blood loss, that the strength to lift oneself up on the cross, not to mention with the, the nails in their hands and their feet to be able to actually pull themselves up, this is very difficult. So what would often happen to, to a victim of Roman crucifixion is that they would die of asphyxiation. Uh, they wouldn't die of their wounds, although that did happen. They died of asphyxiation. They wouldn't be able to breathe anymore. Now, the Romans were really good at this process, but even when they weren't so good at it, 
uh, to hasten the death of a victim, they would break their legs. And this is exactly what you see recounted in the gospel stories, is that the, that the Romans went around to, to, the, to the cross to look at, to see if the people had died yet, and they would break their legs. Why would they do that? Well, because you can't lift yourself up if you can't push off of your feet, right? So they, they would break their legs to kind of hasten the end of death. Now, what we know from, from, uh, from the gospel narratives is that Jesus didn't need to have his legs be broken. He didn't, he didn't need to have his legs be broken. He had already died. But a spear was thrust into his, into his side, uh, uh, into his heart, uh, for good measure, right? Uh, for, for good measure to, to, to hasten his death or to ensure that he was actually dead. Now, the death of Jesus, that's the question we're asking right now, did he die, is well corroborated by uh, secular historians in Jesus' day and shortly after his day. And it's accepted by nearly all modern scholars, even, even liberal scholars who would say the Bible doesn't really tell us, uh, you know, tell us about who God is, but they would say, yeah, look, the Bible does recount this story accurately. Jesus did die. If you're liberal or conservative, religious or non-religious, the, the vast scholarly consensus is that Jesus was actually killed on the cross. Tacitus, a contemporary historian, uh, said in his annals, uh, writing of the early Christians, he says this, Christus, from whom the name had its origin, that is the name of the Christian community, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, uh, Pontius Pilatus. Now, not to mention the fact that this corroborates a, a, a number of details from the biblical account of Jesus' death. It assumes that Jesus actually did die. He suffered the extreme penalty and if it's not death, then what is? So this is something that, that has wide scholarly consensus. Jesus did indeed die on a Roman cross. Next, I want to ask, was, was Jesus actually buried? See, the Gospels mention that he was buried in the tomb of a man named Joseph of Arimathea. Some of you who may have heard this story before, this will sound familiar to you, that Jesus was buried in, this, in, the, in the tomb of this man named Joseph of Arimathea. Now, the, 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 this, this particular individual, Joseph of Arimathea, he would have been a member of the Jewish ruling council called the Sanhedrin, which means that if, if, that, man's, if that man is named and he's a part of this significant Jewish council, then his tomb that he owned would have been locatable. Does that make sense? People could have found it because it was a pro- piece of property owned by a well-known individual. Uh, so uh, people could have known where this was. Now, was Jesus buried? There's no rival story in ancient literature about what happened to Jesus' body after it was placed on the cross. So after Jesus died, there's no other story. There's just this one uh, that, that recounts him being buried in the tomb of, of Joseph of Arimathea. It's attested uh, by Mark, Matthew, and John. So all three of these writers of the histories of Jesus' life mentioned that he was buried in this man's tomb. Uh, the, the, the Apostle Paul, one of Jesus' earliest followers, uh, he reported that Jesus was buried. Um, and and he, he reported in a, in a text that had its origins in, in probably around the early 30s of the Common Era that Jesus was buried as well. Now, let's think about this for a second. Was Jesus buried? Let's just assume that this story of being placed in the tomb of Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea was made up. That would be the claim, right? Well, people make up stories about stuff all the time, right? So was this just made up? Well, let's talk about this. Joseph of Arimathea was a member of the Sanhedrin, which was the Jewish ruling council, which had limited religious authority uh, under, under, of course, the Roman political authority. This was the group that condemned Jesus to death for blasphemy, for claiming to have a special relationship to God, for claiming indeed to be God. Now, why would you make up a story, if you're making this up, about giving Jesus, a blasphemer, a proper burial in the tomb of a well-known man if it wasn't true? It's too easy to falsify, right? It'd be too easy in the ancient world to falsify that story. You would want to pick somebody who was maybe a bit more obscure or maybe somebody who was legendary. Surely not somebody who, who could have, you could have located which piece of property they owned. Certainly not somebody with that big of a profile. That big of a profile would have made it too easy to falsify that story. Now, moreover, more than that, Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea, would not have been a likely candidate for belief in Jesus. If you are making this up, why would you choose somebody who is on the group that condemned him to death? 
it would have been unlikely that anybody as a part of that group would have would have uh, would have you know would have stepped forward to say yeah he can have my he can have my tomb unless it was true. So if you're making it up, it's a bad lie. It's a poorly construed lie. That's what I'm suggesting to you. So was Jesus buried? I think so. I think we have good re- good reason to believe that. Now, if he was buried, did his tomb get emptied at some point? And how did that happen? Now, this idea of this story, or this story of the empty tomb, this is reported in all of the Gospels. All of the histories of Jesus' life report this story, that, that the tomb was empty at some point. And even in Mark, and Mark was the earliest gospel, probably datable to the, to the early 50s uh, of the common era. But it's also reported in 1 Corinthians 15, which 1 Corinthians 15, although it was probably written in the mid-50s, it has, that particular passage in 1 Corinthians 15 can be dated to the early 30s of the common era. Now, if you know anything about the history of Jesus' life, he was likely executed around the year 30 of the common era. And yet there's, there's a story claiming that his tomb was emptied, that he was no longer in his tomb from the early 30s of the common era. So I think an obvious question is, okay, yeah. He, he, his tomb was emptied, but wasn't his body just stolen? Well, this is actually exactly what, what the, the Jewish ruling council and other kinds of, uh, of religious authorities uh, in Jesus' day, this is what they claimed is that the, the body was stolen. Uh, but here's the thing, is that if the body was stolen, this does presuppose an empty tomb. So regardless of what happened to Jesus' body, people in his day believed that the tomb was empty. That's all I'm trying to answer right now. Was the tomb empty? People in his day believed that his tomb was empty. Now, how do we, how, what's another reason why we would believe that Jesus' tomb was empty? It, it wasn't ever made a place of veneration until much, much later in history. Um, So what would often happen in Jesus' day is that when when a holy person or a respected person who had some kind of religious significance, whenever they died or if they were killed, their tomb where their body was placed would become a place of religious devotion. People would come there and have maybe some kind of religious ritual or at least some kind of ceremonial remembrance of the significance of that person. There were over 50 of these kinds of tombs in Palestine in Jesus' day. So you have somebody who has this kind of significance, who has this this number of followers, and there was not a place where people came to venerate this physical tomb of of the founder of this movement. Isn't that curious? There wasn't a place of veneration. And this was actually very common for these places to be around in that day. Now, was the tomb empty? I think there's, there's another reason, and I think this is probably the best reason. There were women who claimed that it was emptied, and these women were, the, were, were written down as the first witnesses to Jesus, uh, Jesus' tomb being emptied. Now, why is that significant? You have to kind of get in the first century mindset for a minute, and it's not too, not too hard to imagine what that would be like. But in the first century world, a woman could not give testimony in a court case. They're, they're, they, they weren't uh, trusted to be reliable witnesses. Now, if you're making up a hoax, why would you put the, the, the key lie in your hoax into the mouths of women? If you're making it up and you're saying that the tomb was empty, you would think that you'd put it in, in the mouth of somebody else. If you're inventing a story, this would be a bad way to do it, right? If you're saying that the tomb is empty, you've, you've made a mistake in how you, how you put that story together. Now, if women actually were the first witnesses to the tomb being emptied, well, this would then be a mark of authenticity. That is that whoever's writing this story down has put a detail in there that helps us as people who are far removed from the text to be able to authenticate historically what happened inside the text. Emptied were women. That you're able to look at it and say, well, wait a minute. The key witnesses to this tomb being emptied were women. So that means that they probably weren't making it up because that would be an embarrassing detail. And you'd want to gloss that over or make up something else. I'll talk more about that in just a minute. So was the tomb emptied? I think so. And I think most, most people in Jesus' day believed that it was empty. Now, the tomb being empty is a necessary condition for Jesus having risen from the dead. But it's not sufficient, right? It's not sufficient. I think a key question that we want to ask now is, did anyone see it? This is the big thing, right? Somebody rises from the dead. There has to be some kind of evidence of this, right? And now, you know, it's not the kind of thing you can put in a lab and get evidence on it, right? 
but you have to have some kind of historical evidence. Did anybody actually see this? Well, the earliest histories that we have record 12 different appearances of Jesus having risen from the dead. Now, in all of these accounts, there's a subtext that each of these eyewitnesses who report having seen the risen Jesus, that they could have been consulted by the original hearers of the histories or the original readers of the histories. So what I mean by that is this, that when, when, there, are, when there are stories of Jesus having appeared to somebody, they're often accompanied by names. And the names often have, have modifiers to them. You know, you, you, can, you can go ask this person. You can go ask this person. The idea was that when somebody was writing down this history, they would record who the eyewitness was so that the people who were hearing the story could go and ask that eyewitness to confirm the details. Does that make sense? Given, that the, given the fact that, that the gospel materials uh, in which these stories live are, are all easily datable uh, within the first century of the common era, this makes, the, this makes corroborating eyewitness testimony something that was very possible. People could go and ask somebody, did this actually happen? Hey, I read this book that Mark wrote about Jesus having risen from the dead. It says you've seen him. Did you see him? <laughs> this is a question somebody could have asked, right? Now, here's the thing is that uh, were these visions of an embodied person or a disembodied person? Well, they were a vision, in fact, of an embodied person. The stories that, that, that are from these earliest eyewitnesses of Jesus having risen from the dead record him eating things. You could touch his physical body. And in the Jewish worldview in which these stories originate, there was no concept of a disembodied resurrection. The, the Jewish worldview that these stories come out of, they had no idea of there being somebody who, would, who was dead who would then rise from the dead in a disembodied way. Resurrection was an idea that was deeply Jewish in its theological background, and it always entailed physicality, corporeality, that there was a physical body that had once been dead that was no longer dead. So there, there's this idea that, that, uh, that, that, uh, people would rise from the dead in Jewish theology. But this idea was very different from what happened in, in the gospel story because the idea from Jewish theology about rising from the dead was all about the end of history. It was always about at this last day, this final culminating day, people will rise from the dead. People who had been dead will no longer be dead. But there was no idea in Jewish theology about there being one person who would rise from the dead before the end of history. That was not a part of their, of their conceptual worldview. So it's unlikely that this idea that Jesus would physically rise from the dead would have come from Jewish expectations about their Messiah. In fact, Jewish expectations about the Messiah were of a military leader, a conqueror, not a God who would be crucified, but somebody who would defeat their oppressors, in this case, the Romans. What I'm saying is that you can't psychologize the resurrection experience. Somebody saying, I've seen Jesus and I saw his actual body, you can't say, well, you were expecting to see a physical body rise from the dead. They would say, no, what are you talking about? We have no concept of this. The concept was always end of history and everybody. It was never one person in the middle of your oppression. So you can't psychologize it. You can't say, well, those people were expecting that to happen. When you expect things, you tend to see them. There was nothing like that happening with the, with the people who claimed to see the risen Jesus. And again, and I'll harp on this a little bit more right now. Harp's a strong word. I won't harp. Women claimed to see the risen Jesus. Again, it would have been a poorly construed invention to make women the first eyewitnesses to this key founding event in a religion. So if you're trying to, to create a hoax of a religion so that you can gain authority or influence over people, that would be the postmodern narrative, right? That you want to be able to, to have some kind of authority or you want to be able to, to, uh, to manipulate people. If you're making up a story, why would you put the key event into the mouths of women in that ancient world? They weren't even trusted to give witness in a court case. And this is the great thing about this. This story, not only is it a mark of authenticity that Jesus rose from the dead, but it represents something particular in Christian theology that I think it's important to know a little bit about. See, God has a particular view of women in the Bible. 
And sometimes you hear kind of bumper sticker readings that are really misreadings of how the Bible looks at women. But the Bible is deeply affirming and liberating of women. The Bible, the Bible uh, throughout the narrative of Scripture, women are honored. They're given places of prominence. In cultures of disrespect, they're given, they're given honor and respect. And in this story, women are entrusted by Jesus to be the first people who preach about his resurrection. In, 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 uh, in, the, in John's account of Jesus' resurrection, Jesus commands the women, go and tell what you've seen. The first preachers of the Christian gospel were women. In Christian theology, women have a vital task to perform in participating with God's plans for the world. God sees women's current reality and he legitimates them. He confounds the world's politics of gender by giving women the place of prominence that they always deserved. Anything else is a misreading of how the Bible talks about women. Now, again, if you're making all this up, why would you make it up this way? It's, instead, it's a mark of authenticity. It would have been embarrassing or scandalous for people who were reading these accounts or listening to them to hear that the eyewitnesses were women. And so if, if, it, was, you know, if it was just an attempt to, to gain power over people, it was a poor, poorly executed attempt. So was this all a conspiracy? Were people just making this up? Well, the key people who, who followed Jesus who were the initial, initial people to, to be witnesses about what Jesus did, to give testimony about Jesus having risen from the dead. All of Jesus' original disciples, they died for having given that testimony, except for his disciple John, who died in prison. All of them were murdered for their proclamation that Jesus had risen from the dead, except for one person who died in prison for it. If this was a conspiracy to gain power and influence over other people, uh, then, then they, why would you die for it? If this is just a hoax, why die for it? Moreover, in the story about Jesus' death, Jesus' followers all abandoned him right before his death. If you're trying to make this up, that I've seen the risen Jesus, then if you're trying to do that to gain influence or to gain power over others, then why would you make yourself the most embarrassing part of the story? The person who, who left Jesus, who abandoned him before he died. Why would you do that? You'd want, to, you'd want to play the role of the person who believed in him to the end. But none of his disciples did that. If it's a hoax, why would you die for it? Now, was this just a hallucination? People say they, you know, they, they saw Jesus rise from the dead. People say they see all kinds of weird crap, right? <laughs> you guys know that. People say they see all kinds of weird stuff all the time. Well, there's a large number of people. There's 12 different stories of this. Uh, which totals probably about 500 people or so. Now let's talk about this idea of a collective hallucination. People have written about this. Psychologists have written about the possibility of collective hallucinations. And in a collective hallucination, it's always a number of people and all at once. Now whenever the, there's a psychologist who claims that there's a collective hallucination, this is kind of unfalsifiable. What I mean by that is that if they say that this group, group A over here, they all had the same hallucination at one time. When you start talking about a group of people all having a hallucination, then you as the person outside of the group are automatically begging the question of, well, wait a minute, how do you know that we didn't all see the same thing? We can corroborate it among each other and you didn't see it. Maybe you're the one who's hallucinating. And so the idea becomes, well, how big does the group have to be for it to no longer be a hallucination? How, you know, how small does the group have to be, to be for you to be able to say, well, this is really just a collective hallucination? Is it 51 people? Well, at 52 people, it becomes collective hallucination. But at 51, maybe that really happened. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, that, or sorry, at 53, maybe it really happened. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Like, at what point it's a group that could be a collective is kind of an arbitrary number, okay? But even so, let's just say collective hallucinations can happen. Maybe that happens. Psychologists who write about this, who study this kind of phenomenon of, of collective hallucinations, they claim that whenever there's a collective hallucination, that there is some kind of expectation and emotional excitement beforehand that, that the group will see what they're expecting to see. Does that make sense? 
that whenever there's a collective hallucination, people have an expectation of what, of, of, uh, that they will see what they end up seeing in their hallucination. But this idea of expectation and excitement wouldn't have applied to Jesus' followers. Why is that? Well, their follower, sorry, their, their friend and their leader had just been executed on a Roman cross. And they thought that he was the Jewish Messiah who was going to be a military conqueror. That doesn't make one very excited, does it? No, of course, it makes somebody dep- depressed, uh, you know, despairing. It would make them, make them be scared and worried for their own lives, which is exactly, of course, what the biblical stories tell about Jesus' followers. Now, would they have expected, yes, we're going to see Jesus physically rise from the dead? No, they wouldn't have seen that because they had, no, again, in Jewish theology, no concept of a single person having a fully embodied resurrection. Their only concept was of a general resurrection at the end of history. So there's no expectation about it. Of course, no excitement. They would have been dejected, grieving, and depressed. Another thing about hallucinations, and this is from psychologists, psychologists say that hallucinations do not evidence existential change. Whenever somebody has a hallucination, that typically doesn't lead to any kind of altering of one's life and way of life. In fact, Often when people have a a hallucination, especially when people have collective hallucinations, uh, people are are often willing to deny that they had that vision if other people are not convinced of the truth of that vision. People are talked out of their hallucinations very easily by psychologists. If, if If you're part of a group that hallucinates something, it's very easy for people to be talked out of having seen that. You can kind of tell them, hey, look, that didn't really happen. All of us didn't see that. We have no evidence that that really happened. People will be talked out of that very easily. This does not apply to people who are willing to die for what they've seen. People who have collective hallucinations can be easily talked out of them. They're not, they're not willing to die for them. And Jesus' followers were willing to die for what they claimed to have seen. Now, mass hallucinations... Also, uh, they have no correlation uh, to mass insanity either, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, so if, if you're claiming that all these people saw Jesus and they're all really insane, there's no correlation psychologically between mass hallucinations and mass insanity. Insanity is a little bit more hard to pin down and it's more personal. Moreover, the hallucinations stopped. And people who claim to, to have uh, collective hallucinations, they typically claim that these hallucinations are still accessible uh, beyond, beyond, you know, beyond their initial event of having, of having seen whatever they claim to have seen. But the hallucinations in the case of the story of Jesus rising from the dead, they stopped after 40 days. That is, the people who had claimed to see him claimed that they could no longer see him after about 40 days. There is nobody in any historical record, uh, or sorry, any early historical record, who claims to have seen the risen Jesus physically in the New Testament, in the time of the writing of the New Testament. Moreover, if you had visited a tomb that had a body in it, you could easily falsify any hallucination, right? Right? Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> so, okay, isn't this all just a legend? All right, so I've said a number of things here, but at the end of the day, isn't this all just a legendary story? Well, I think there's a good reason to believe why that's not the case. And I want to read you, I want to read you a passage from, uh, from the Bible. And this is from 1 Corinthians. This was written by, by one of Jesus' earliest followers, a man, a, na- a man named Paul. And what you read here in 1 Corinthians is actually a very early, a very early telling of the resurrection of Jesus. It's 1 Corinthians 15, and it's 1 through 8. Paul says, Let me remind you now, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. You welcomed it then, and you still stand firm in it. In this good news that sa- it is this good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you. Unless, of course, you believed something that was never true in the first place. I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins just as the scriptures said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day just as the scriptures said. He was seen by Peter and then by the twelve, his disciples, his earliest followers. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he was seen by James, 
and later by all the apostles. Last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. Paul saying, I had, I had seen him as well. Now this, this story was probably written down, or sorry, this, this letter was probably written down around, around the mid-50s. But people who, who are, are skilled, uh, skilled historical theologians and, and biblical scholars can look at this text and they can see that there's, there's some marks in this text which make us think that it's actually much earlier. This text was written originally in Greek, but this portion of it that I just read to you, sorry, the letter was written in Greek, this portion of it that I just read to you has signs that it was originally written down or spoken by people in the language of Aramaic. Aramaic was the language that Jesus and his followers probably spoke to one another, all right? And so Paul, writing this in Greek, is translating a, 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 a source that had been given to him in Aramaic. And scholars, even, even skeptical biblical scholars, say that this portion of Paul's text in 1 Corinthians 15 comes from the early 30s of the common era. That is just years after Jesus' death and his rising from the dead. And this, this text in 1 Corinthians 15, 15 here speaks of a, an empty tomb, that there was a physical resurrection. Now, no one disputes Paul's authorship of this particular letter, and Paul was quoting an early creed. So even, even Gerd Ludemann, a skeptical historian of the Bible, a skeptical biblical scholar, says that this was probably from about two years after Jesus' death. And, and what happened in Paul's life, the person who wrote this down, is he had an incredible transformation. You notice that he said, and I was the last of these people, as though I'd been born at the wrong time to have seen this. Well, let's talk about Paul's transformation. Isn't this just a legend? Paul was somebody who tracked down Jesus' followers, who got permission from the authorities to go after Jesus' followers, and he was complicit in the murdering of some of Jesus' early followers. He was a persecutor of early Christians. And, and yet, by this point in Paul's life, he's defending that Jesus had actually risen from the dead. He's saying, no, this really happened. I saw it. Now, what can explain something that happened in somebody's life that would turn them into a murderer, somebody who is persecuting Christians, to somebody who is defending the key event for which he was earlier persecuting them? What could best explain that transformation? He was a successful Jewish scholar. And he was convinced against his beliefs. What can explain that? Then that we can actually just take him at his word that he actually saw something. He actually saw the risen Jesus. Now in this story, in this, in this, this letter in 1 Corinthians, Paul lists somebody that's very important. His name is James. James was one of Jesus' brothers. And we know from early church history, from, from the book of Acts in the Bible, that James was the leader of the Jerusalem church, which would have been, in the early days of the Christian community, the most prominent church, the most important church. But James, in, in, in the gospel stories, did not believe that Jesus was who he said he was. James was, James was Jesus' brother, but he, he didn't believe that Jesus was who he claimed to be. And yet, this person, James, had also been convinced that Jesus had risen from the dead. And Paul's telling us James actually saw him after he'd risen from the dead as well. So somebody else who had, who, had, who had to be convinced out of their beliefs now was a prominent member of Jesus' early worshiping community. Why would he change his mind if he hadn't seen something? Now, it would have been embarrassing to the leader of, of, a, of a, a developing church, of a developing religious group, if people had made up stories about him opposing Jesus and, and, and then later on, well, he actually saw him from the dead. If you're just making that up, you would want to make the leader of your religious movement into an early believer. Somebody who said, no, I, I, this is my brother. I believe in him. I always believed in him. That's why I should be the leader of this Jerusalem church. But people who do historical studies of these kinds of texts, they use a criterion for determining historicity. It's called the criterion of embarrassment. I've been talking about it, alluding to it a little bit tonight is that when there's an embarrassing detail that's told in a history, uh, a, a detail that would have been embarrassing for whoever was uh, involved in the writing of that history or who would have been impacted by the writing of the history, um, if there was an, that kind of embarrassing detail, that's actually a mark of authenticity. If you're making up a story, you would leave out those kinds of embarrassing details. But if that's what actually happened, you'd put them in there. 
because it would be true to what actually happened and everybody would know if you were making something up. That's the criterion of embarrassment. Historians use that for other kinds of texts and it applies here. The witnesses of Jesus', uh, of Jesus uh, resurrection, they would have been available. There's an early, uh, uh, this assumes an early dating of the New Testament materials, something that is kind of beyond the scope of my lecture tonight. Also, very early in the history of, of, of the, the, the people, or sorry, the, very early in Christian religious history, people were worshiping Jesus as being God. Very early. Now, this would have been scandalous in his day because Jewish people had this very strong sense that there was one God. And yet, there was this man who's actually God, and he died, and he rose from the dead. God doesn't die. Jesus' earliest followers were worshiping him as divine. This is, ta- this is told to us through, uh, through the historian Pliny the Younger, who was, of course, no Christian. He reports that the worship of Jesus uh, can be dated as early as the second century of the Common Era. The book of Philippians, a, a Christian book, uh, speaks of Jesus' pre-existence and his exaltation as God. And that book was probably written in the mid-first century of the Common Era. People were worshiping Jesus as divine. Why did they worship him that way? Well, because they believed he actually rose from the dead physically. Moreover, Jesus' earliest followers, who were Jewish, changed their day of religious observation, their day of worship, from Saturday to Sunday. That would have been a major social shift for them, something that would have gone against the grain of everything in their culture to start worshiping on Sunday. See, they claimed that Jesus had risen from the dead on Sunday, but in Jewish culture, you observed, the, you observed uh, you know, religious ceremonies. You would, you would have religious practices on the Sabbath day, which would have been from sundown on Friday to sundown on Saturday. Saturday was the Sabbath day. But people started worshiping Jesus on Sunday. Well, why did they do that? Well, it's probably because something important happened to them on Sunday. So I think we have here a strong historical case that when people talk about Jesus having risen from the dead, they're not just talking about some kind of private, subjective faith claim. That these reasons that I've given you, these are all public and accessible. These are the kinds of things that we can interact with and question about. They're not the kinds of things that are just kind of private to me, the thing that I I think about when I'm at the foot of my bed praying at the end of the day. It's something that's public and accessible. But if this is true, if Jesus did actually rise from the dead, then what do we do with something like this? Well, I think... First, we need to know that death is not the end of the story. In Christian theology, death is imminent. It's something that happens to all of us, and it is formidable. And I think for people in the modern world, death is imminent for us. It's something that we know could always be around the corner. It's part of life. But if, if, if Jesus actually rose from the dead, then that means that death, which has this kind of, this kind of shadow over modern existence, it doesn't have that much power. It's not something to be feared. It's something that will come to an end because Jesus is alive, because God has actually conquered death. Moreover, the the resurrection of Jesus entails that there is meaning for this life. Jesus' resurrection is a triumph of life over death because God's authority and God's presence is redeeming and remaking the earth. So if Jesus actually rose from the dead, then history culminates in God having risen from the dead, conquering death and initiating a plan of redemption for the world. So history is not meaningless, it's purposeful. And it's something that we can interact with in meaningful ways to bring God's healing and restoration, additional resurrection, reviving of the world into place because we partner with the God who's risen from the dead. If Jesus is risen from the dead, what this means is that you have to deal with the person and work of Jesus Christ. You have to deal with who he is. You have to deal with Jesus. Is he who he says he is? We all have to ask that question. And you have to decide based on the evidence at hand. None of us can go back to the, to the first century of the common era in Palestine. But based on the evidence we have, Do we think that he is who he says he is? Did he actually rise from the dead? You don't have to take a leap of faith. You have to take a step in the direction of the evidence that you have. And I think the question for all of us is, are we we willing to take a step? At this point, I'd be happy to, to talk with you, to answer any questions. 
um, just to, to, to dialogue a little bit. I think uh, uh, Nicholas will, ha, has a few here. If you've been texting them in, I'd be happy to kind of interact for those things now. Thanks. Mm-hmm. You can just take a seat oh, here. Sure. Um, just want to, just a few things, just to remind you, you can, we are, we welcome you forward with your question in person, or if you're a little more shy, um, you can uh, text that link uh, on the little sheet of paper. Uh, either way is okay. I just want to draw your attention to uh, the, sh- the sheet on your seat. Uh, this is our next event, uh, Were the Crusades Really That Bad? But also, uh, I'd encourage you to fill out a Connect card uh, that's in front of you in your seat back pocket. Um, fill out this uh, card so that we can be in touch with you about future events, but also uh, we'll, at the end of the night we'll collect them and we'll raffle off two of these t-shirts that I'm wearing. I know you all want one. We have them for sale out there for $10, but uh, if you fill out this card, and um, uh, our, we'll, we'll raffle off two uh, t-shirts. So uh, thanks again, Ike. I mean, Andrew. I know you as Ike. You can call me Ike. Okay, yeah. thank you. You can call me Ike. Reverend Ike. Reverend Ike? Reverend Ike, uh, yeah. if you don't mind. Okay. Um, so we're going to start with uh, a question um, uh, from online. Um, it, it relates to what you mentioned in the beginning about some presuppositions you had. Mm-hmm. Um, can faith and reason coexist? Yeah, that's a good question. So I, I think I can only come at this from the realm of, of Christian theology, which is my world. I'm a committed follower of Jesus. And as a committed follower of Jesus, I... I would develop a theology about this question from reading the Bible primarily, but also reflection of of other Christians on what the Bible has to say. And I think when you you start to get into what the Bible says about the relationship between faith and reason, you see two things that are really working at the same task, and the task is knowledge. Uh, And and I would would add kind of a second item that that the two are related uh, to is, is commitment. What kind of person am I willing to be? And what can I know? A lot of times in the modern world, when people talk about faith, they talk about things that are kind of unverifiable. Uh, you, can, you can get a good discussion on this from reading Francis Schaeffer or Nancy Piercy. I'd recommend both their work to you. But they have this idea of a two-story view of truth. That is that there's this world of, of empirical facts, which is kind of a lower story. And these are the things that we know. History, science, logic. This is the world of facts. But when we start talking about faith, we're talking about kind of an upper story. And this upper story of faith includes things that are unverifiable, that are mere matters of opinion, things like your perspective on art, uh, which kind of taco you think is best, right? Uh, Your perspective on morality even kind of goes in this upper sphere of things that are kind of unverifiable and unpublic. And I think when you read Christian theology, you get a sense that this kind of two-story view of truth doesn't really make any sense at all, because the claims in the Bible are historical claims, and people are willing to die for them. Uh, for, for them being historical claims. That is, that people believe that Jesus actually risen from the dead, in the case of what we're talking about tonight, and they were willing to be killed for it. And so these claims were the kinds of things that you could stake your life on, uh, to think about it that way. Moreover, there are places in the Bible which, which speak of a very strong relationship between faith and knowledge. I think of one, for example, Hebrews 11, which says, it says that faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the certainty of things not yet seen. The, the uh, Christian theologian St. Augustine said that faith is a kind of volitional consent. That is, it's an act of will that's based upon what you know. I have to, I have to be willing to step out based on the knowledge that I have. I'm consenting to the truth of something with my life. And so I think faith and reason are actually really intimately related in that regard. Thank you. Samuel, uh, yeah. Also, I like that. I would say that faith. blind faith and reason don't coexist, but if you redefine faith as something that's sure. reasonable to believe sure, based yeah. on evidence. And I think it does, it does matter what, how, what, you, what you mean when you use that word faith, right? Uh, it's, not, it's not a leap in the dark. It's a step into the light. Yeah, sorry, you had a question. And I yeah, my real question. No, my real question. <laughs> yeah, no, it was my fault. I, um, uh, you said that 1 Corinthians 15 is dated to the early 30s, whereas the whole book is... To the 50s? That confused me, and I'd love to No, I appreciate that. asking for clarification. This may have been unclear when I said it, too, so I'm glad you asked. Uh, so 1 Corinthians was a letter that was written in the 50s, probably about the mid-50s of the Common Era. That portion, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 8, that uh, biblical scholars date that portion 
to the early 30s. Uh, the, the skeptic scholar Gerd Ludemann dates it to about, uh, about 32. It's about that year, 32, 33. And he doesn't believe that Jesus actually rose from the dead. He just believes that that, that, that was something that, that, was, uh, that was believed by his followers and, and was an item of worship. It was a liturgical passage that formed part of their worship experience as early as 32 or 33. So that would have been a source that Paul in the mid-50s used in the writing of Paul, he, or the writing of 1 Corinthians, he would have used that earlier source, if that makes sense. So in the, in the Gospel of Matthew, it states, And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, and coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Do you think that this sort of dampens the importance of the resurrection and of Jesus' resurrection and you also stated that in an open lid universe system that miracles could be commonplace. So in what way are they special? Yeah, that's a good question. I think uh, miracles are special more for the, for the kind of um, response they elicit in those who experience them. They're not special in the sense of they, they're not ordinary or they, they shouldn't be seen as ordinary. But they're special in the sense of when somebody receives a miracle, they're right to be grateful and exuberant about having received it, Does that, if that makes sense. Um, now, when I say that they, that, they, that they may be commonplace, I'm not necessarily saying that they are commonplace. I'm just saying that if God exists, then miracles may happen on a regular basis. They may still be rare, uh, but, if, but if God exists, they're at least possible. And all we need for, is kind of a minimum criterion for answering the question, Jesus, did Jesus rise from the dead, is was this physically possible? Well, in a world where God exists, the answer is yes. If, God, if we can have a good reason for saying God certainly does not exist, then I think you know, we should all just go home and you know, maybe start reading Camus, be a French existentialist of some kind. That was a philosophy joke, which always kind of bombed. Uh, but, um, sorry, you had another question. Uh, which, yeah, the yeah, Gospel of Matthew. Now, I'm not going to venture into the Gospel of Matthew on this issue because this is an incredibly, uh, incredibly complex issue there are some Christians who believe that that actually happened, and there are some Christians who still believe that the Bible is true, who believe that that particular aspect of the Matthew story is, um, is what they would call a part of a genre of apocalyptic literature. So there's actually a, a large debate about this, and you can go and read all about it online between Michael Lacona and, um, and, and Lydia McGrew and Norm, Norman Geisler if you want to read more about this, but there's people who believe that the Bible tells the truth about what happened there who disagree on that particular detail. Was it the kind of thing that was more of a piece of apocalyptic literature or was it something that, was, uh, that physically happened? Um, and I, I don't know the answer to that about that particular issue. Yeah. Hey, how's it going now? My name is Gabe. Uh, yeah, thank you for tonight, by the way. Um, I'm, I'm not too shy to use the mic. I'm just a little bit too tall. So. <laughs> But uh, yeah, my question is actually with 1 Corinthians 15 yeah. um, in the account that Paul gives of each of the witnesses. Uh, my question is, do you think Paul had a knowledge um, of the women you know, that were the first to see Christ? Because he doesn't mention them there. Or do you think for a specific reason he actually left them out? Because I think that, that's an yeah. interesting account because he, he was, you know, as far as I know, very close to Luke. But um, I, I know some of the accounts are, are different in certain areas. So that, that's just mine for um, the, the accounts of the women. Yeah, that's a good question. You know, would he have known about the, about the accounts of the women? He doesn't mention them. Um, and I think at that point, we're, you know, it's really just kind of an item of, of ignorance, historical ignorance, that is. What did Paul know? What did he not know? We do know, obviously, from that, pa that passage, well, I shouldn't say obviously, that passage uh, assumes that Paul had some knowledge of James uh, having, and, and of you know, maybe 500 others. Uh, but what other kinds of knowledge he had um, are not clear from that passage. Now, we do know some other things from Paul's life that he, he probably spent a significant amount of time in Jerusalem uh, being tested uh, by, by Jesus' earliest followers. So Paul, he, he claims to have seen the risen Jesus uh, uh, when he was on one of his persecution campaigns. Uh, he claims to have a vision of the risen Jesus. And uh, after he claims that, uh, you can imagine that Jesus' earlier fo earliest followers would have been skeptical about his sincerity, right? Uh, was, was he just merely claiming to have seen this, or did this actually happen to him? And so it seems to be, that it seems to, uh, you know, from, from other details in Paul's life, that he probably spent some time being questioned by, by Jesus' followers 
and then eventually coming to have some kind of assurance that he was indeed uh, a faithful member of the, this early group of Jesus worshipers. Um, but his relationship to the women, I'm not sure if we know enough to say that. Um, yeah, good question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, had, I had another thought about that one. Um, uh, if you want to read more about that issue, about w- what did Paul know and who, who he was, you know, who, who did he talk to, uh, Gary Habermas has a good chapter, or uh, yeah, a good chapter on that in, in one of his books. I can't remember which one, but Gary Habermas, you can look him up. Uh, Habermas, he teaches at Liberty University. He's written about this issue, yeah. Any other questions? Um, going back to what you began your talk with, the philosophical foundations, uh, someone asked the question, what is the best argument for the universe being an open system instead of a closed system? Hmm. Yeah, I think the, uh, I, I'm not necessarily making an argument for, for an open system. I'm saying that if God exists, then an open system is possible. Because that then, uh, again, in a closed system, you have cause and effect, chance and necessity, plus nothing. So you have, you have a, a, a system where everything is the result of some kind of initiative cause, some kind of uh, a first event. But after that, there's no additional causes or persons or agents in the universe that can affect some kind of change in the natural course of happenings in the, in the universe. What I'm suggesting is that if there is a being who's outside of the universe, then indeed that being may potentially have the power to intervene in the system, and to have some kind of interactive, uh, uh, c- continual interactive presence within that open system. So I think maybe, the, and I, I'm, I'm just spitballing on this because this isn't my field, um, but I, I would say maybe a minimal, uh, a, a minimal argument for an open system uh, begins with an argument for theism, but it also could, could end with uh, any one uh, case of a, mir- of a miracle. Any single miracle disproves a closed system. Uh, you know, any kind of you know, case where you know that, that all, if you could account for all the, the causes and effects and all the necessity in the universe and you knew that this was a, a genuine miracle, then that would be kind of enough there. That's a pretty high bar epistemically to know that. Uh, but again, I think I'd rather go with the existence of God as, being, as, as opening one up to that possibility. Yeah, good question. Excellent. Um, we have a question from Kyle. The only uh, brave person to put his name on all, any of these questions that we received. <laughs> so I commend you, Kyle. Kyle you get a gold star. <laughs> um, so I have a question from Kyle. Um, how do you account for the discrepancies between the Gospels? What day was the crucifixion? Did Simon carry the cross or just Jesus? Was Mary Magdalene o- o- the only woman to see the empty tomb or many women? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, the, the account in John is that there was many women there. Um, and was it just Mary? Well, if, if, if Mary Magdalene was recorded as having seen Jesus, uh, that doesn't disprove that the other women didn't see him, right? Uh, the, these, two, these two details can be, you know, can be married together. They can, they can coexist. Just because one person's seen something doesn't mean that a group of others did not see it, if that makes sense. Um, and that's the case with a number of events in the Gospels that are so-called dis- discrepancies, um, and so, you know, a good, a good synoptic introduction to the New Testament would be able to address these kinds of issues. Uh, but what I would say, just with, with, you know, thinking about a couple of these, uh, is that the fact that there are different tellings of the story uh, is actually a mark in favor of the story's authenticity. Uh, because different storytellers have different perspectives, and they have access to different eyewitnesses. Uh, and so you get this with, with any kind of secular history that's told today. Uh, you know, with, uh, you take something that is more known to us, uh, the invasion of, or sorry, the, the, um, uh, the counterinsurgency in Fallujah in 2004. Uh, if you read the New York Times, you're going to get a different telling of that story than if you read the Wall Street Journal on it. It's because there's, there's two writers who have different perspectives on what happened. They have access to different sources. They have different biases in what they're telling. Uh, and if you add in non-Western sources into that, Al Jazeera's telling of the, of the counterinsurgency in Fallujah is going to be different from both the Western sources. And so the, the fact that there are different tellings of a single event or a set of events uh, actually seems to speak of that event having happened. Uh, now, if you were making up all of the stories at once, you'd want them to be more or less uniform. 
But the fact that they're all, they all have a little bit different takes on, on the same set of events is actually a mark in the favor of authenticity, not a mark against it. Now, a mark against the authenticity would be if there was actually a true contradiction between two different accounts in the Bible. So the fact that, that Simon carried the cross and that Jesus carried the cross, uh, we, we know this, we, we, we don't have a difficulty with, with this because are these two ideas mutually exclusive with one another? No. The, not, neither of the accounts claim that Simon only carried the cross and that Jesus didn't, claim, didn't carry it or that Jesus only carried the cross and there wasn't somebody else who carried it. Uh, they just claim to, to that there were people who, who both carried the cross. We have another one from Kyle. Cool. He was hard at work listening. <laughs> That's good. To you. Um, so he says, good historical evidence needs to be something written contemporaneously with their supposed occurrence, but the Gospels weren't written until decades after their supposed occurrence. Good evidence? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, I, I appreciate that question. That's, that's an honest one. Um, in the ancient world, histories were often written uh, for, you know, pe- long after the initial events that they purport to describe took place. Uh, for example, uh, um, uh, Tacitus's Annals uh, of Rome were written, were written some, some time after the, the founding events uh, that he's describing. Um, uh, you know, there's, there's other kinds of sources, uh, old, you know, old historical sources, which were written centuries after. Uh, in fact, everything that we know about Alexander the Great comes from hundreds of years after his life and death. Does that mean that we, do, that we don't trust what we have written about Alexander the Great? No, it just means we have to, we have to understand that historical evidence in light of the fact that it may be centuries old. Now, in this case, the fact that they were decades and not centuries after the events that they purport to describe actually is in favor of historicity because, uh, because that means that eyewitnesses were still alive at the time of the writing of the Gospels to falsify any of the details that were in the Gospels. Uh, so somebody could have stepped forward. Moreover, the Gospels are corroborated by secular histories at the time. Uh, so I, I mentioned one uh, from, from the writer Tacitus, Josephus, uh, uh, Suetonius, uh, Pliny the Younger. Um, these are all uh, secular historians who are non, uh, not, not Christian in their religious orientation who corroborate certain events in the, in the, uh, the biblical data. There's also archaeological evidence, which seems to support uh, the biblical data as well. Uh, we've unearthed the, the Pool of Bethesda, which is spoken of in the book of Mark. Uh, we have evidence historically that Pontius Pilate existed, uh, which uh, Pontius Pilate was probably only a procurator for a couple of years. And so having, having hard historical evidence, there's an inscription with his name on it in the, the Jewish site of Caesarea uh, that you can look at that speaks of Pontius Pilate actually existing. Um, here's one more, uh, one more uh, piece of evidence in favor of historicity. Uh, there are some scholars who in the, in the past have claimed somebody who was crucified would never be given the kind of ceremonious and, and religious uh, burial that Jesus was given. So that means being placed in a proper tomb. That means people coming to anoint the body and, and to wrap it properly. But crucifixion victims were never given this kind of treatment. Uh, the, the scholar uh, John Dominic Crossan has famously said that Jesus was most likely killed on the Roman cross and then his body was left in the side of the road for dogs to eat. Well, we have evidence of a crucifixion victim uh, from the first century in Judea uh, who, who received a proper Jewish burial. There's an ossuary, which is a bone box, of a man named Johannan. And Johannan's body shows the marks of crucifixion on, its, on his bones. Now, the fact that he's in a bone box is significant because that means that his body was placed into a rock tomb where the flesh was allowed to decay on it, and then the bones were removed from that tomb and placed in this bone box, this ossuary, uh, to be kept by the family. So Johanna was a crucifixion victim who received a proper Jewish burial. And so that's just, that just corroborates one set of details uh, in the biblical story from archaeology. We've got somebody on uh, Facebook Live that is wondering, can you sum up real quick <clears throat> the counter argument made against those that say Jesus really didn't die on the cross, but he was just wounded or unconscious? He couldn't get that part of the argument, so can you just sum that up real quick? Yeah, and that's actually something I didn't spend too much time talking about the so-called swoon theory, um, or there are some, there are some, uh, um, some Muslims who claim that Jesus didn't die on the cross, um, I'm not here to pick a bone with Islam. It just is a matter of Islamic theology that there tends to be some denial of Jesus having, having died actually on the cross. Um, 
the first thing I would say is that Western historians have almost completely abandoned this thesis. So for some reason, this idea that Jesus was, just appeared to have died, um, that, uh, that for some reason, this is, this is something that people are still interested in talking about. But even the most skeptical of Western historians of, of the biblical age don't, don't believe it. <laughs> no, one, no one really holds that opinion. In fact, the swoon theory can probably be dated uh, to, to, uh, to, um, uh, to uh, Schopenhauer, who was, you know, uh, it was an, Enlightenment, an Enlightenment age thinker. It was, no one, no one in, the, in the ancient world believed this. Uh, moreover, uh, I think that this detail of, of how skilled the Romans were at crucifixion is key. So skilled that the breaking of legs was often common to speed the asphyxiation process. And in the case of Jesus, there's, there's an element that's added in of the spear being thrust into his side, blood and water flowing from the wound, ensuring that this had actually happened. Now, a detail I didn't mention is that uh, uh, medical, uh, you know, uh, medical scholars, historians of medicine, I should say, who've read this account, they can corroborate what's happened in this account with what they would expect to have happened when somebody has endured extreme blood loss and death by asphyxiation. That is that there would be a certain amount of fluid that would, a certain amount of extra fluid, which would be surrounding the heart at that time. So that, that was, you would expect to see blood and water flowing from a wound for somebody who had died in this way. Yeah. To tag along on that, uh, the swoon theory, um, we have two questions. Uh, one says, didn't Jesus go to India or Japan instead of being crucified? Or what are some examples of secular accounts of uh, Jesus after he died? Yeah, um, I think, you know, most people would say a secular account of Jesus after they died. I mean, they would say, well, he was dead and he remained dead. Uh, what happened to his body? Maybe we don't know. Um, perhaps it was stolen by his followers, but that seems unlikely given the fact that they were willing to die for it. But uh, um, but, you know, his body was just maybe in an, in an unknown tomb or maybe it was moved at some point. We just don't know. I think that's what a secular, a secular writer would say on this issue. Uh, for somebody who claims that Jesus went to India or Japan, um, I think the burden of proof is historical. Is there some kind of historical account that we can look to that provides some kind of reliable information uh, that could corroborate this story? The truth is, is that there just isn't. And so, I mean, from an historical perspective, I don't, I don't want to write off this question because it seems like a fair question, except for on a historical level, the, historical level there's no reason to, to go down this road of thinking that this is a live option. Um, there's no, nobody, who, nobody who has, you know, some kind of ancient source that can be dated as early as the Gospels that has a credible story to, to the otherwise, if that makes sense. Thank you. We just got a question from Aberforth asking... Is belief in the resurrection a requisite of salvation? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I have a friend who actually just wrote about this, um, and so I'm going to just footnote on his, on his uh, telling of this. Uh, it's a scholar named Craig Blomberg, who I think has spoken in this venue before. I'd recommend his work on this in general. Uh, from a, the perspective of Christian theology, I think the answer to this question is yes. Now, when, I, when we say the word belief, we have to have an account of what, of what we mean by the word belief. You believe all kinds of things. I do too. And uh, you, you have strong, some beliefs that are stronger than others. For example, I have a much stronger belief that I'm sitting on a stool right now than my belief that Adele exists, right? Okay. That was just kind of a silly way to say that. But, right? You probably do too, right? Has anybody physically seen Adele? Maybe a couple of you who've gone to her concert. But you probably have a, lot, a much stronger belief that there's a, a lanky-looking philosopher of religion sitting up on the stage uh, than, than, you, than your belief that Adele exists. Uh, but you still have a belief that she exists, right? You may have seen her on television. You may have like, listened to some of her albums before. Uh, you may have appreciated her music and said, well, there's a source, surely, behind that music. It's not just some kind of, uh, some kind of uh, 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 you know, com- an invention of the computer age. Uh, so you have some kind of belief that she exists, uh, but your belief that I'm here is stronger. And I think your, your belief in the resurrection doesn't have to be at the most strong level for somebody to be saved. Again, I think what, what God asks of us is, the, is acting in accordance with the evidence that we have. 
And so that, that belief, that, that willing to, to, to believe, is really evidenced by sort of a minimalistic stepping out and being, being willing to behave and live as if that's true. So I don't think one has to believe perfectly and all the time with 100% certainty that Jesus rose from the dead. But I think there's a level that can only be judged by God of, of does this person have some kind of trust that I am who I say I am, the crucified and risen Lord. And this is why I ended my, my lecture with just discussing, you have to come to terms with who Jesus is. And so I'm not here to sit in judgment over anybody and to tell you who you ought to be. But I am willing to tell you as, as a philosopher, as an historian, that you need to deal with this question. You have to come to terms with who this person was. And now, I don't think that God would ever expect you to have 100% certainty all the time. But he is asking you to respond with your life and say, yes, I'm willing to, to believe this. When did they switch from Saturday to Sunday, being the holy day, and where is that switch mm -hmm. recorded? I've heard it happened much later when Catholicism became prevalent in the Roman Empire. Yeah, and that's, there's all, this, all, this kind of garbage always comes up. Not, not, not to say that you were, your question was garbage. This, I've heard this, that this happened with, when Catholicism uh, took over in the Roman Empire. These are, like, uh, these are the kinds of things that get told in, in college religion courses, but there's no evidence that, 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 that it happened this way. In fact, our earliest historical evidence is that this happened in the second century, long before Christianity was made legal and long before it was made the official religion uh, of, of Rome, uh, that there was, there was a switch in the second century of the common era. So we're talking 100s. That's the, that's the earliest source that we have that talks about this. So what often happens with these kinds of questions is that somebody who's not a historian, they're trained in religious studies, will say something like, well, we know that, you know, that, Christianity was made the official religion by Constantine, and that's, you know, Constantine, he put the Bible together, and, you know, he changed the day from worship, you know, of worship from Saturday, made everybody worship on Sunday. This is simply not the case. Uh, you know, I, I would recommend a good history of, of early Christianity to you. Uh, a couple of ones that, that come to mind right now are Paul Johnson's The Story of Christianity. I would also recommend Rodney Stark's The Rise of Christianity to learn about some of these sociological trends as well. So we have a more in-depth question. Good. If Mark, oh, there we go. If Mark 16, 9 through 20 was added in the second century and originally ends, the woman said nothing, and other gospels cite Mark and Q all at least 30 years past his death, wouldn't this be an easier legend to create? Yeah, well, it's far from obvious that the, that the, gospels, that the gospels were citing Mark and Q 30 years past Jesus' death. Uh, that's not at all obvious. Okay, uh, the, the, many scholars uh, will claim that Matthew and Luke were written in the 50s, maybe. Now, it's possible they were written in the 60s or later, and that's fine. There's no problem with that. But I'm just saying it's far from obvious historically that, it was, that there was that amount of time gap. Um, uh, now, we're talking about the Markan endings here. Um, so we're talking about, you know, the, the longer ending, the freer Logian. Uh, these, these endings, um, most, most scholars who study Mark are still able to say that these endings are authentic, even if they're not original. So most historians of the Bible will still say, this, these, this did happen this way, but they may have not been original to Mark's text. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind with that. Uh, now, is it possible that, that Mark was just ended after verse 8? I think so. I think that's possible. I don't think that does anything to, uh, uh, to disparage the fact that Jesus actually rose from the dead just means that Mark's writing of the story ended there. Can we thank Dr. Shepherdson for his time? Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me.